As soon as the light in the bedroom went out, there was a stirring all through the farm buildings. Word had gone round that old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a strange dream and wished to communicate it to the other animals. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the big barn as soon as Mr. Jones was safely out of the way. At one end of the barn, on a raised platform, Major was already ensconced on his bed of straw under a lantern. He was twelve years old, a majestic-looking pig with a wise and benevolent appearance. Before long, the other animals began to arrive. First came the three dogs, Bluebell, Jessie and Pincher, and then the pigs, who settled down in the straw immediately in front of the platform. The hens perched on the window sills, the sheep and cows lay down behind the pigs. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and setting down their vast hairy hooves with great care, lest there should be some small animal concealed in the straw. Clover was a stout, motherly mare approaching middle life. Boxer was an enormous beast, nearly 18 hands high and as strong as any two ordinary horses put together. After the horses came Muriel, the goat, and Benjamin, the donkey. Benjamin was the oldest animal on the farm and the worst tempered, but he was devoted to Boxer. When Major saw that the animals had all made themselves comfortable, he cleared his throat and began. Comrades, I do not think that I shall be with you for many months longer. And before I die, I feel it my duty to pass on to you such wisdom as I have acquired. Now, what is the nature of this life of ours? Let us face it, our lives are miserable, laborious and short. We are born, we are given just so much food as will keep the breath in our bodies, we are forced to work to the last atom of our strength, and the very instant that our usefulness has come to an end, we are slaughtered. The life of an animal is misery and slavery, that is the plain truth. But is this simply because this land is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life to those who dwell upon it? No, comrades. The soil of England is fertile, its climate is good. This farm of ours would support a dozen horses, twenty cows, hundreds of sheep, and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. Why then do we continue in this miserable condition? Because nearly the whole of the produce of our labor is stolen from us by human beings. There, comrades, is the answer to all our problems. It is summed up in a single word, man. Man is the only creature that consumes without producing. He does not give milk. He does not lay eggs. He is too weak to pull the plow, yet he is lord of all the animals. Only get rid of man, and the produce of our labor would be our own. Almost overnight, we could become rich and free. What then must we do? Why work night and day for the overthrow of the human race? That is my message to you, comrades. Rebellion. I do not know when the rebellion will come. It might be in a week or in a hundred years, but I know that sooner or later justice will be done. Fix your eyes on that, comrades. And remember that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. Even when we have conquered him, do not adopt his vices. No animal must ever live in a house or sleep in a bed or wear clothes, or drink alcohol, or smoke tobacco, or engage in trade. All the habits of man are evil. And above all, no animal must ever tyrannize over his own kind. Weak or strong, clever or simple, we are all brothers. No animal must ever kill another animal. All animals are equal. And now, comrades, I will tell you about my dream of last night. It was a dream of the earth as it will be when man has vanished. But it reminded me of something that I'd long forgotten. The song my mother used to sing. It is called Beasts of England. Beasts of England, beasts of Ireland, 
Beasts of every land and clime Hearken to my joyful tidings Of the golden future time Soon or late the day is coming Tyrant man shall be a throne And the fruitful fields of England Shall be trod by beasts alone the singing of this song threw the animals into the wildest excitement. Almost before the Major had reached the end, they had begun singing it for themselves. The cows lowed it, the dogs whined it, the sheep bleated it, the horses whinnied it, the ducks quacked it. Unfortunately, the uproar woke Mr. Jones, who sprang out of bed and let fly a charge of number six shot into the darkness. The pellets buried themselves in the wall of the barn and the meeting broke up hurriedly. Everyone fled to his own sleeping place, and the farm was asleep in a moment. Three nights later, Old Major died peacefully in his sleep. This was early in March. During the next three months, there was much secret activity. Major's speech had given to the more intelligent animals a completely new outlook on life. They saw clearly that it was their duty to prepare for the rebellion. The work of teaching and organizing fell naturally upon the pigs who were recognized as being the cleverest. Preeminent among them were two boars named Snowball and Napoleon. Napoleon was a large, fierce-looking Berkshire boar with a reputation for getting his own way. Snowball was more vivacious, quicker in speech and more inventive. All the other male pigs on the farm were porkers. The best known was a small fat pig named Squealer, who was a brilliant talker. The others said of Squealer that he could turn black into white. These three had elaborated Old Major's teachings into a system of thought to which they gave the name of animalism. Several nights a week, they held secret meetings in the barn and expounded the principles of animalism. Now, as it turned out, the rebellion was achieved much earlier and more easily than anyone had expected. In past years, Mr. Jones had been a capable farmer, but of late he had fallen on evil days. He had taken to drinking. His men were idle, the fields were full of weeds, and the animals were underfed. June came and the hay was almost ready for cutting. On Midsummer's Eve, Mr. Jones went into Willingdon and got so drunk that he did not come back till midday. The men had gone out rabbiting without bothering to feed the animals. When Mr. Jones got back, he immediately went to sleep, so that when the evening came, the animals were still unfed. At last, they could stand it no longer. One of the cows broke in the door of the store shed, and all the animals began to help themselves from the bins. It was just then that Mr. Jones woke the next moment he and his men were in the store shed lashing out with whips. This was more than the hungry animals could bear. With one accord, though nothing had been planned beforehand, they flung themselves upon their tormentors. After only a moment, the men took to their heels. And so, almost before they knew what was happening, the rebellion had been successfully carried through. Jones was expelled, and the manor farm was theirs. For the first few minutes, the animals could hardly believe in their good fortune. Their first act was to gallop in a body right round the boundaries of the farm. Then they raced back to the farm buildings to wipe out the last traces of Jones's hated reign. The harness room was broken open. The bits, the nose rings, the dog chains, the cruel knives were flung down the well. Then they sang Beasts of England from end to end seven times. And after that, they settled down for the night and slept as they had never slept before. But they woke at dawn as usual, and suddenly remembering the glorious thing that had happened, they all raced out into the pasture together. Yes, it was theirs. In the ecstasy of that thought, they gambled round and round. They hurled themselves into the air in excitement. Then they filed back to the farm buildings and halted in silence outside the door of the farmhouse. That was theirs too, but they were frightened to go inside. After a moment, however, Snowball and Napoleon butted the door open and the animals entered. 
They tiptoed from room to room, gazing with awe at the unbelievable luxury, at the beds with their feather mattresses, the looking glasses, the horsehair sofa. Some hams hanging in the kitchen were taken out for burial, otherwise nothing was touched. A unanimous resolution was passed on the spot that the farmhouse should be preserved as a museum. All were agreed that no animal must ever live there. The animals had their breakfast, and then Snowball and Napoleon called them together. Comrades, said Snowball, we have a long day ahead of us. Today we begin the hay harvest, but there is another matter that must be attended to first. The pigs now revealed that during the past three months, they had taught themselves to read and write from an old spelling book which had been thrown on the rubbish heap. Napoleon sent for pots of paint and led the way down to the five-barred gate that gave on the main road. Snowball took a brush between the two knuckles of his trotter, painted out Manor Farm, and in its place painted Animal Farm. This was to be the name of the farm from now onwards. After this, Snowball and Napoleon explained that the pigs had succeeded in reducing the principles of animalism to seven commandments. The commandments were written in great white letters that could be read 30 yards away. They ran thus, whatever goes on two legs is an enemy, whatever goes on four legs or has wings is a friend, no animal shall wear clothes, no animal shall sleep in a bed, no animal shall drink alcohol, no animal shall kill any other animal. All animals are equal. Now, comrades, cried Snowball, to the hayfield. Let us make it a point of honour to get in the harvest more quickly than Jones. But at this moment, the cows set up a loud lowing. They had not been milked for 24 hours and their udders were bursting. After a little thought, the pigs milked the cows. Soon there were five buckets of frothing creamy milk at which many of the animals looked with considerable interest. What is going to happen to all that milk, said someone. J Jones used to sometimes mix it in our mash, said a hen. Never mind the milk, comrades, cried Napoleon. That will be attended to. The harvest is more important. Comrade Snowball will lead the way. I shall follow in a few minutes. Forward, comrades! The hay is waiting. So the animals trooped down to the hayfield, and when they came back in the evening, it was noticed that the milk had disappeared. The pigs could think of a way around every difficulty, and the horses understood the business of mowing and raking better than Jones had ever done. The pigs did not actually work, but directed and supervised and every animal down to the humblest worked at turning the hay and gathering it. In the end, they finished the harvest in two days less time than it had usually taken Jones. Moreover, it was the biggest harvest that the farm had ever seen. All through that summer, the work went like clockwork. The animals were happy as they had never conceived it possible to be. With the worthless parasitical human beings gone, there was more for everyone to eat. They met with many difficulties, but the pigs with their cleverness and Boxer with his tremendous muscles always pulled them through. Boxer was the admiration of everybody. From morning to night he was pushing and pulling, always at the spot where the work was hardest. His answer to every problem was, I will work harder, which he adopted as his personal motto. But everyone worked according to his capacity. Nobody stole. Nobody grumbled over his rations. The quarrelling and biting and jealousy which had been normal features of life in the old days had almost disappeared. On Sundays there was no work. Breakfast was an hour later, and after breakfast all the animals trooped into the barn for a general assembly which was known as the meeting. Here the work of the coming week was planned out and resolutions were put forward and debated. It was always the pigs who put forward the resolutions. The other animals understood how to vote, but could never think of any resolutions of their own. Snowball and Napoleon were by far the most active in the debates. 
but it was noticed that these two were never in agreement. Whatever suggestion either of them made, the other could be counted on to oppose it. The meeting always ended with the singing of Beasts of England. The pigs had set aside the harness room as a headquarters for themselves. Here in the evenings, they studied blacksmithing, carpentry, and other necessary arts from books which they had brought out of the farmhouse. Snowball also busied himself with organizing the other animals into what he called animal committees. He formed the Egg Production Committee for the hens, the Clean Tails League for the cows, the Whiter Wool Committee for the sheep. On the whole, these projects were a failure. The reading and writing classes, however, were a great success. The dogs learned to read fairly well. Muriel the goat could read somewhat better than the dogs. Benjamin could read as well as any pig, but never exercised his faculty. So far as he knew, there was nothing worth reading. Clover learnt the alphabet, but could not put words together. Boxer could not get beyond the letter D. None of the other animals on the farm could get further than the letter A. It was found that the stupider animals, such as the sheep, hens, and ducks, were unable to learn the seven commandments by heart. After much thought, Snowball declared that the seven commandments could be reduced to a single maxim: four legs good, two legs bad. So, four legs good, two legs bad was inscribed on the end wall of the barn above the seven commandments and in bigger letters. Napoleon took no interest in Snowball's committees. He said that the education of the young was more important, and took nine puppies away from Jesse and Bluebell, their mothers, saying that he would make himself responsible for their education. He took them up into a loft and kept them there in such seclusion that the rest of the farm soon forgot their existence. The mystery of where the milk went to was soon cleared up. It was mixed every day into the pig's mash. The apples were now ripening, and the orchard was littered with windfalls. The animals had assumed, as a matter of course, that these would be shared out equally. One day, however, the order went forth that all the windfalls were to be collected for the use of the pigs. At this, some of the other animals murmured, but it was no use. All the pigs were in full agreement, even Snowball and Napoleon. Squealer was sent to make the necessary explanations. Comrades, he cried, you do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness and privilege. Many of us actually dislike milk and apples, but milk and apples contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat those apples. Do you know what would happen if we pigs failed in our duty? Jones would come back. Surely, comrades, there's no one among you who wants to see Jones come back. Now, if there was one thing that the animals were completely certain of, it was that they did not want Jones back. So it was agreed that the milk and the apples should be reserved for the pigs alone. Most of this time, Mr. Jones had spent sitting in the tap room of the Red Lion at Willingdon, complaining of the monstrous injustice that had been done. The other farmers sympathised but did not help. Nevertheless, the owners of the two farms which adjoined Animal Farm, Foxwood and Pinchfield, were both frightened by the rebellion. Early in October, a flight of pigeons alighted in the yard of Animal Farm in the wildest excitement. Jones and all his men, with half a dozen others from Foxwood and Pinchfield, were coming up the cart track. They were all carrying sticks, except Jones, who was marching ahead with a gun. Obviously, they were going to attempt the recapture of the farm. This had long been expected, and all preparations had been made. Snowball, who had studied an old book of Julius Caesar's campaigns, was in charge. He gave his orders, and in a couple of minutes, every animal was at his post. As the human beings approached the farm buildings, Snowball launched his attack. All the pigeons flew to and fro over the men's heads and dropped their dung, while the geese rushed out and pecked their legs. 
Then Muriel, Benjamin and the sheep, with Snowball at the head of them, rushed forward and butted the men from every side. But the men were too strong, and suddenly, at a squeal from Snowball, all the animals turned and fled into the yard. The men gave a shout of triumph. They saw, as they imagined, their enemy in flight and rushed after them. This was just what Snowball had intended. As soon as they were inside the yard, the horses, the cows and the pigs emerged in their rear, cutting them off. Snowball now gave the signal for the charge. He dashed straight for Jones, who raised his gun and fired. The pellets scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back, and a sheep dropped dead. Without halting, Snowball flung his 15 stone against Jones's legs. Jones was hurled into a pile of dung and his gun flew out of his hands. But the most terrifying spectacle of all was Boxer, rearing up on his hind legs and striking out with his great iron-shod hooves. At the sight, several men dropped their sticks and tried to run. Panic overtook them, and the next moment all the animals together were chasing them round the yard. They were gored, kicked, bitten, trampled on. There was not an animal that did not take vengeance on them after his own fashion. The men bolted for the main road. The animals now reassembled in the wildest excitement, each recounting his own exploits at the top of his voice. The animals decided unanimously to create a military decoration, Animal Hero First Class, which was conferred then and there on Snowball and Boxer. Animal Hero Second Class was conferred posthumously on the dead sheep. There was much discussion as to what the battle should be called. In the end, it was named the Battle of the Cowshed, since that was where the ambush had been sprung. In January, there came bitterly hard weather. The earth was like iron and nothing could be done in the fields. Many meetings were held in the big barn. It had come to be accepted that the pigs should decide all the questions of farm policy, though their decisions had to be ratified by a majority vote. This arrangement would have worked well enough if it had not been for the disputes between Snowball and Napoleon. These two disagreed at every point where disagreement was possible. Snowball often won over the majority by his brilliant speeches, but Napoleon was better at canvassing support for himself between times. He was especially successful with the sheep. Of late, they had taken to bleating four legs good, two legs bad, and they often interrupted the meeting with this. It was noticed that they were especially liable to break into four legs good, two legs bad at crucial moments in Snowball's speeches. Snowball was full of plans for innovations and improvements. Napoleon produced no schemes of his own, but said quietly that Snowball's would come to nothing and seemed to be biding his time. But of all their controversies, none was so bitter as the one that took place over the windmill. In the long pasture, there was a small knoll, which was the highest point on the farm. After surveying the ground, Snowball declared that this was just the place for a windmill, which could supply the farm with electrical power. This would light the stalls and warm them in winter, and would also run a circular saw, a chaff cutter, a mangle slicer, and an electric milking machine. The animals listened in astonishment while Snowball conjured up pictures of fantastic machines that would do their work for them. Within a few weeks, Snowball's plans for the windmill were fully worked out. All the animals came to look at his drawings at least once a day. Only Napoleon held aloof. He had declared himself against the windmill from the start. One day, however, he arrived unexpectedly to examine the plans. He walked heavily round, looking closely at every detail, then suddenly he lifted his leg, urinated on the plans, and walked out without uttering a word. The whole farm was deeply divided on the windmill. Snowball maintained that it could be done in a year, and thereafter that the animals would only need to work three days a week. Napoleon argued that the great need of the moment was to increase food production. 
The question was put to the vote. The animals assembled, Snowball stood up and set out his reasons for the windmill. Then Napoleon stood up to reply. He said very quietly that the windmill was nonsense and he advised nobody to vote for it and promptly sat down again. At this, Snowball sprang to his feet and shouting down the sheep who had begun bleating again, broke into a passionate appeal in favor of the windmill. By the time he had finished speaking, there was no doubt as to which way the vote would go. But just at this moment, Napoleon stood and casting a peculiar sidelong look at Snowball, uttered a high-pitched whimper of a kind no one had ever heard him utter before. At this, there was a terrible baying outside, and nine enormous dogs wearing brass-studded collars came bounding into the barn. They dashed straight at Snowball, who only sprang from his place just in time to escape their snapping jaws. In a moment, he was out of the door. Amazed and frightened, the animals crowded to watch the chase. Snowball was racing across the long pasture, the dogs close on his heels. With inches to spare, he slipped through a hole in the hedge and was seen no more. At first, no one could imagine where these creatures came from, but the problem was soon solved. They were the puppies whom Napoleon had taken away from their mothers and reared privately. They kept close to him. It was noticed that they wagged their tails to him in the same way as the other dogs used to do to Mr. Jones. Napoleon, with the dogs following him, now announced that the Sunday morning meetings would come to an end. They were unnecessary and wasted time. In future, all questions would be settled by a special committee of pigs presided over by himself. These would meet in private and afterwards communicate their decisions to the others. The animals were dismayed by this announcement. Several of them would have protested if they could have found the right arguments. Even Boxer was vaguely troubled. He tried hard to marshal his thoughts but in the end he could not think of anything to say. Some of the pigs were more articulate. Four young porkers in the front row uttered shrill squeals of disapproval, but suddenly the dogs let out deep, menacing growls and the pigs fell silent. Then the sheep broke out into a tremendous bleating of four legs good, two legs bad, which went on for nearly a quarter of an hour and put an end to any chance of discussion. Afterwards, Squealer was sent round the farm to explain the new arrangement. Comrades, he said, I trust that every animal here appreciates the sacrifice that Comrade Napoleon has made. Do not imagine that leadership is a pleasure. On the contrary, it is a deep and heavy responsibility. No one believes more firmly than Comrade Napoleon that all animals are equal. He would be only too happy to let you make your own decisions for yourselves. But sometimes you might make the wrong decisions, comrades, and then where should we be? Suppose you had decided to follow Snowball, who, as we now know, was no better than a criminal. He fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed, said somebody. Bravery is not enough. Loyalty and obedience are more important. One false step and our enemies would be upon us. Surely, comrades, you do not want Jones back. Once again, this argument was unanswerable. On the third Sunday after Snowball's expulsion, the animals were surprised to hear Napoleon announce that the windmill was to be built after all. Squealer explained privately that Napoleon had never really been opposed to it. On the contrary, the plan which Snowball had drawn had actually been stolen from among Napoleon's papers. The windmill was, in fact, Napoleon's own creation. Why then, asked somebody, had he spoken so strongly against it? Here, Squealer looked very sly. That, he said, was Comrade Napoleon's cunning. He had seemed to oppose it simply as a maneuver to get rid of Snowball, who was a dangerous character and a bad influence. This, said Squealer, was something called tactics. The animals were not certain what the word meant, but Squealer spoke so persuasively and the dogs growled so threateningly that they accepted his explanation without further questions. All that year, the animals worked like slaves. 
But they were happy in their work, aware that everything they did was for themselves and not for a pack of idle, thieving human beings. In August, Napoleon announced that there would be work on Sunday afternoons as well. This was strictly voluntary, but any animal who absented himself from it would have his rations reduced by half. The windmill presented difficulties. Huge boulders had to be dragged up the slope to the top of the quarry where they were toppled over the edge to shatter into manageable pieces. It was a slow and laborious process. Nothing could have been achieved without Boxer. To see him toiling up the slope inch by inch, the tips of his hooves clawing at the ground and his great sides matted with sweat filled everyone with admiration. The animals were not badly off. Nevertheless, as the summer wore on, various unforeseen shortages began to make themselves felt. There was need of paraffin oil, nails, string, dog biscuits, none of which could be produced on the farm. One Sunday, when the animals assembled to receive their orders, Napoleon announced that he had decided on a new policy. From now on, Animal Farm would engage in trade with the neighboring farms. Not, of course, for any commercial purpose, but in order to obtain certain materials which were necessary. Once again, the animals were conscious of a vague uneasiness. Never to have dealings with human beings. Never to engage in trade. Never to make use of money. Had not these been among the earliest resolutions passed at that first triumphant meeting after Jones was expelled? Yet Napoleon announced that he'd already made all the arrangements. There would be no need for the animals to come into contact with human beings. He intended to take the whole burden on his shoulders. A Mr. Wimper, a solicitor, had agreed to act as intermediary between Animal Farm and the outside world and would visit the farm every Monday to receive his instructions. Indeed, when Mr. Wimper came, the sight of Napoleon on all fours delivering orders to Wimper who stood on two legs roused their pride and partly reconciled them to the new arrangement. It was about this time that the pigs suddenly moved into the farmhouse and took up their residence there. Again, the animals seemed to remember that a resolution against this had been passed in the early days and again, Squealer was able to convince them that this was not the case. It was absolutely necessary, he said, that the pigs should have a quiet place to work in. It was also more suited to the dignity of the leader to live in a house than in a mere sty. Nevertheless, some of the animals were disturbed when they heard that the pigs not only took their meals in the kitchen and used the drawing room as a recreation room, but also slept in the beds. Boxer passed it off as usual with, Napoleon is always right. But Clover, who thought she remembered a definite ruling against beds, went to the end of the barn and tried to puzzle out the Seven Commandments. It says, no animal shall sleep in a bed with sheets, Muriel told her. Curiously enough, Clover had not remembered sheets, but as it was there on the wall, it must have been so. By autumn, the windmill was almost half built. November came with raging southwest winds. One night, the gale was so violent that the farm buildings rocked on their foundations. In the morning, the animals came out of their stalls to find that an elm tree had been plucked up like a radish. They had just noticed this when a terrible sight met their eyes. The windmill was in ruins. With one accord, they dashed down to the spot. Napoleon, who seldom moved out of a walk, raced ahead. Yes, there it lay, the fruit of all their struggles leveled to its foundations. The stones they had broken and carried so laboriously scattered all around. Comrades, said Napoleon quietly, do you know who is responsible for this? Snowball, he roared in sheer malignity to avenge himself for his ignominious expulsion this traitor has crept here and destroyed our work of nearly a year comrades here and now i pronounce the death sentence upon snowball no more delays 
happens this very morning we begin rebuilding the windmill. It was a bitter winter. In January, food fell short. The corn ration was drastically reduced and starvation seemed to stare them in the face. Soon it became obvious that it would be necessary to procure some more grain from somewhere. One Sunday morning, Squealer announced that the hens must surrender their eggs. Napoleon had accepted through Wimper a contract for 400 eggs a week. The price of these would pay for enough grain and meal to keep the farm going until summer. When the hens heard this, they raised a terrible outcry. For the first time since the expulsion of Jones, there was something resembling a rebellion. Led by three young black Menorca pullets, the hens made a determined effort to thwart Napoleon's wishes. Their method was to fly up to the rafters and there lay their eggs, which smashed to pieces on the floor. Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly. He ordered the hen's rations to be stopped and decreed that any animal giving so much as a grain of corn to a hen should be punished by death. For five days the hens held out, then they capitulated. Nine hens had died in the meantime. All this while, no more had been seen of Snowball. Suddenly, in the spring, an alarming thing was discovered. Snowball was secretly frequenting the farm by night. Every night, it was said, he stole the corn, he upset the milk pails, he broke the eggs. The animals were thoroughly frightened. One evening, Squealer called them together. Comrades, a most terrible thing has been discovered. Snowball has sold himself to Frederick of Pinchfield Farm who is even now plotting to attack us. But there is worse. Snowball was in league with Jones from the very start. It has been proved by documents which he left behind him and which we have only just discovered. To my mind, this explains a great deal, comrades. Did we not see ourselves how he attempted to get us defeated and destroyed at the Battle of the Cowshed? The animals were stupefied. It was a wickedness far outdoing Snowball's destruction of the windmill. They all remembered, or thought they remembered, how they had seen Snowball charging ahead of them at the Battle of the Cowshed, and how he had not paused even when the pellets from Jones's gun had wounded his back. It was difficult to see how this fitted in with his being on Jones's side. Even Boxer was puzzled. I do not believe that, he said. Snowball fought bravely. I saw him myself. Did we not give him animal hero first class immediately afterwards? That was our terrible mistake, comrade. For we know now, it is all written down in the secret documents that we found, that in reality he was trying to lure us to our doom. But he was wounded. We all saw him running with blood. That was part of the arrangement. Jones's shot only grazed him. Do you not remember how Snowball fled and many animals followed him? And how when panic was spreading, Comrade Napoleon sprang forward with a cry of death to humanity and sank his teeth into Jones's leg? Now, when Squealer described the scene, it seemed to the animals that they did remember it. But Boxer was still a little uneasy. I do not believe that Snowball was a traitor at the beginning, he said finally. What he has done since is different, but I believe that at the Battle of the Cowshed he was a good comrade. Our leader, Comrade Napoleon, announced Squealer, speaking very slowly and firmly, has stated categorically that Snowball was Jones's agent from the very beginning. Ah, uh, that is different, said Boxer. If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. That is the true spirit, comrade, cried Squealer. But it was noticed he cast a very ugly look at Boxer with his little twinkling eyes. He turned to go, then paused and added impressively, I warn every animal on this farm to keep his eyes very wide open. For we have reason to think that some of Snowball's secret agents are lurking among us at this moment.
When they were all gathered together, Napoleon emerged from the farmhouse with his nine huge dogs frisking round him and uttering growls that sent shivers down all the animals' spines. They cowered silently in their places, seeming to know that some terrible thing was about to happen. Napoleon stood sternly surveying his audience. Then he uttered a high-pitched whimper. Immediately the dogs bounded forward, seized four of the pigs by the ear and dragged them, squealing with pain and terror, to Napoleon's feet. The pigs' ears were bleeding, the dogs had tasted blood, and for a few moments they appeared to go quite mad. To the amazement of everybody, three of them flung themselves upon Boxer. Boxer saw them coming and put out his great hoof, caught a dog in mid-air and pinned him to the ground. The dog shrieked for mercy and the other two fled. Boxer looked at Napoleon to know whether he should crush the dog to death or let it go. Napoleon appeared to change countenance and sharply ordered Boxer to let the dog go, whereat Boxer lifted his hoof and the dog slunk away. Presently the tumult died down. The four pigs waited, trembling. Napoleon now called upon them to confess their crimes. They were the same four pigs as had protested when Napoleon had abolished the Sunday meetings. Without any further prompting, they confessed that they had been secretly in touch with Snowball and had collaborated with him in destroying the windmill. When they had finished their confession, the dogs promptly tore their throats out. And in a terrible voice, Napoleon demanded whether any other animal had anything to confess. The three hens who had been ringleaders in the attempted rebellion now came forward and stated that Snowball had appeared to them in a dream and incited them to disobey Napoleon's orders. They too were slaughtered. Then a goose came forward and confessed to having secreted six ears of corn and eaten them in the night. Then a sheep confessed to having urinated in the drinking pool, urged, so she said, by Snowball. They were all slain on the spot. And so the tale of confessions and executions went on until there was a pile of corpses lying at Napoleon's feet and the air was heavy with the smell of blood. When it was over, the remaining animals, except for the pigs and dogs, crept away in a body. Since Jones had left the farm, no animal had killed another animal. They made their way onto the little knoll where the half-finished windmill stood, and with one accord they sat down as though huddling together for warmth. Clover, Muriel, Benjamin, the cows, the sheep, the hens. For some time nobody spoke. The knoll where they were lying gave them a wide prospect across the long pasture, the spinney, the ploughed fields and the red roofs of the farm buildings with the smoke curling from the chimneys. It was a clear spring evening. The grass and the bursting hedges were gilded by the level rays of the sun. Never had the farm, and with a kind of surprise they remembered that it was their own farm, appeared to the animals so desirable a place. As Clover looked down the hillside, her eyes filled with tears. If she could have spoken her thoughts, it would have been to say that this was not what they had aimed at when they set themselves years ago to work for the overthrow of the human race. These scenes of terror and slaughter were not what they had looked forward to on that night when Old Major first stirred them to rebellion. If she herself had had any picture of the future, it had been of a society of animals set free from hunger and the whip, all equal, each working according to his capacity, the strong protecting the weak. Instead, they had come to a time when no one dared speak his mind, when fierce growling dogs roamed everywhere, and when you had to watch your comrades torn to pieces after confessing to shocking crimes. There was no thought of rebellion in her mind, but still it was not for this that she and all the other animals had hoped and toiled. At last, feeling this to be in some way a substitute for words she was unable to find, she began to sing Beasts of England. The other animals sitting round her took it up, 
they sang it three times over, very tunefully, but slowly and mournfully, in a way they had never sung it before. They had just finished singing when Squealer, attended by two dogs, approached them. He announced that by a special decree of Comrade Napoleon, beasts of England had been abolished. The animals were taken aback. Why? cried Muriel. It is no longer needed, comrade, said Squealer stiffly. In Beasts of England, we expressed our longing for a better society in days to come. But that society has now been established. Clearly, this song has no longer any purpose. A few days later, when the terror caused by the executions had died down, some of the animals remembered, or thought they remembered, that the Sixth Commandment decreed, no animal shall kill any other animal. Clover asked Muriel to read her the Sixth Commandment. It ran, no animal shall kill any other animal without cause. Somehow or other, the last two words had slipped out of the animal's memory. Throughout that year, they worked even harder than they had worked in the previous year. To rebuild the windmill with walls twice as thick as before, together with the regular work of the farm, was a tremendous labor. There were times when it seemed that they worked longer hours and fed no better than they had done in Jones's day. All orders were now issued through Squealer or one of the other pigs. Napoleon himself was not seen in public as often as once a fortnight. When he did appear, he was attended not only by his retinue of dogs, but by a black cockerel who marched in front of him and acted as a kind of trumpeter, letting out a loud cock a doodle doo before Napoleon spoke. Even in the farmhouse, it was said, Napoleon inhabited separate apartments. He took his meals alone and always ate from the Crown Derby dinner service. Napoleon was now never spoken of simply as Napoleon. He was always referred to in the formal style as our leader, Comrade Napoleon. And the pigs liked to invent for him such titles as Father of all animals, Terror of mankind, Duckling's friend and the like. It had become usual to give Napoleon the credit for every successful achievement and every stroke of good fortune. So two cows, enjoying a drink at the pool, might exclaim, Thanks to the leadership of Comrade Napoleon, how excellent this water tastes. In the autumn, by a tremendous exhausting effort, for the harvest had to be gathered at the same time, the structure of the windmill was finished. Two days later, Napoleon gave out that he had arranged to sell a pile of timber left over from Jones's time to Frederick, the neighboring farmer. Soon the timber was being carted away at high speed. When it was all gone, another special meeting was held to inspect Frederick's banknotes. Smiling beatifically, Napoleon reposed on a bed of straw on the platform with the money at his side neatly piled on a china dish from the farmhouse kitchen. The animals filed slowly past and each gazed his fill. Three days later, there was a terrible hullabaloo. Wimper, his face deadly pale, came racing up the path on his bicycle and rushed into the farmhouse. The next moment, a choking roar of rage sounded from Napoleon's apartments. The news of what had happened sped round the farm like wildfire. The banknotes were forgeries. Frederick had got the timber for nothing. Napoleon called the animals together immediately and in a terrible voice pronounced the death sentence upon Frederick. At the same time, he warned them that Frederick might attack at any moment. The very next morning, the attack came. There were 15 men with half a dozen guns and they opened fire as soon as they got within 50 yards. The animals took refuge in the farm buildings and peeped out from the chinks and knot holes. The whole of the big pasture, including the windmill, was in the hands of the enemy. For a moment, even Napoleon seemed at a loss. The animals watched and a murmur of dismay went around. Two of the men had produced a crowbar and a sledgehammer. They were going to knock the windmill down. Impossible, 
cried Napoleon. We have built the walls far too thick for that. They could not knock it down in a week. Courage, comrades. But Benjamin was watching the movements of the men intently. They were drilling a hole. Slowly, Benjamin nodded his long muzzle. I thought so, he said. They're going to pack blasting powder into that hole. Terrified, the animals waited. After a few minutes, the men were seen to be running in all directions. Then there was a deafening roar. All the animals except Napoleon flung themselves flat on their bellies. When they got up again, a huge cloud of smoke was hanging where the windmill had been. Slowly, the breeze drifted it away. The windmill had ceased to exist. At this sight, the animals' courage returned to them. The fear and despair they had felt a moment earlier were drowned in their rage against this vile, contemptible act. This time, they did not heed the cruel pellets that swept over them like hail. It was a savage, bitter battle. A cow, three sheep, and two geese were killed. Three men had their heads broken by blows from boxers' hooves. Another was gored in the belly by a cow's horn. When they saw they were in danger of being surrounded, the men ran for dear life. The animals had won, but they were weary and bleeding. They limped into the yard. The pellets under the skin of Boxer's leg smarted painfully. He saw ahead of him the heavy labor of rebuilding the windmill, but it occurred to him that he was eleven years old and that perhaps his great muscles were not quite what they had once been. It was a few days later that the pigs came upon a case of whiskey in the cellars of the farmhouse. That night there was the sound of loud singing. In the morning a deep silence hung over the farmhouse. Not a pig appeared to be stirring. It was nearly nine o'clock when Squealer made his appearance walking slowly and dejectedly, his eyes dull. He called the animals together and told them that he had a terrible piece of news to impart. Comrade Napoleon was dying. A cry of lamentation went up. Straw was laid down outside the doors of the farmhouse and the animals walked on tiptoe. At 11 o'clock, Squealer came out to make another announcement. As his last act upon earth, Comrade Napoleon had pronounced a solemn decree. The drinking of alcohol was to be punished by death. By the evening, however, Napoleon appeared somewhat better. The next day it was learned that he'd instructed Wimper to purchase in Willingdon some booklets on brewing and distilling. A few days later, Muriel, reading over the Seven Commandments to herself, noticed that there was yet another of them which the animals had remembered wrong. It read, No animal shall drink alcohol to excess. Late one evening, two pigeons came racing in with the news. Boxer has fallen. He's lying on his side and can't get up. About half the animals rushed out to the knoll where the windmill stood. There lay Boxer, between the shafts of the cart, his neck stretched out, unable even to raise his head. A thin stream of blood trickled out of his mouth. Clover dropped to her knees. Boxer, she cried, how are you? It is my lung, said Boxer in a weak voice. It does not matter. I think you will be able to finish the windmill without me. To tell you the truth, I'd been looking forward to my retirement. We must get help, said Clover. Run, somebody, and tell Squealer what has happened. All the animals immediately raced back to the farmhouse. Squealer appeared full of sympathy and concern. He said that Comrade Napoleon had learned with the deepest distress of this misfortune and was already making arrangements to send Boxer to the hospital at Willingdon. The animals felt a little uneasy at this. They did not like to think of their sick comrade in the hands of human beings. For the next two days, Boxer remained in his stall. In the evenings, Clover talked to him, while Benjamin kept the flies off him. However, Benjamin and Clover could only be with Boxer after the working hours, and it was in the middle of the day 
when the van came to take him away. The animals were all at work when they were astonished to see Benjamin come galloping from the direction of the farm buildings, braying at the top of his voice. Quick! he shouted. Come at once! They're taking Boxer away! The animals broke off work and raced back. Sure enough, there in the yard was a large van with lettering on its side and a sly-looking man sitting on the driver's seat, and Boxer's stall was empty. The animals crowded round the van. Goodbye, Boxer, they chorused. Fools! Fools! shouted Benjamin, prancing round them and stamping the earth with his small hooves. Do you not see what is written on the side of the van? That gave the animals pause, and there was a hush. Muriel began to spell out the words, but Benjamin pushed her aside, and in the midst of a deadly silence, he read, Alfred Simmons, horse slaughterer and glue boiler, Willingdon. Do you not understand what that means? They are taking Boxer to the knackers. A cry of horror burst from all the animals. At this moment, the man whipped up his horses and the van moved out of the yard at a smart trot. All the animals followed, crying out at the tops of their voices. Just at that moment, Boxer's face, with its white stripe down his nose, appeared at the small window at the back of the van. Boxer! cried Clover in a terrible voice. Get out quickly! They are taking you to your death! All the animals took up the cry of, Get out, Boxer! Get out! but the van was already drawing away from them. Then there came the sound of a tremendous drumming of hooves inside the van. Boxer was trying to kick his way out, but alas, his strength had left him, and in a few moments the sound of drumming hooves grew fainter and died away. In another moment, the van was disappearing down the road. Boxer was never seen again. Three days later, it was announced that he had died in the hospital. It was the most affecting sight I have ever seen, Squealer told them, wiping away a tear. At the end, he whispered that his sole sorrow was to have passed on before the windmill was finished. Here, Squealer's demeanour suddenly changed and his little eyes darted suspicious glances from side to side. It had come to his knowledge, he said, that a wicked rumour had been circulated. Some of the animals had noticed that the van was marked horse slaughterer and had actually jumped to the conclusion that Boxer was being sent to the knackers. It was almost unbelievable that any animal could be so stupid. The explanation was really very simple. The van had previously been the property of the knacker and had been bought by the vet who had not yet painted the old name out. That was how the mistake had arisen. Years passed, the seasons came and went, the short animal lives fled by. A time came when there was no one who remembered the old days before the rebellion, except Clover, Benjamin, and a number of the pigs. Muriel was dead. Bluebell, Jesse, and Pincher were dead. Jones, too, was dead, he had died in an inebriate's home. Snowball was forgotten. Boxer was forgotten, except by the few who had known him. Clover was a stout old mare now, stiff in the joints and with a tendency to roomy eyes. Napoleon was a mature boar of 24 stone. Only old Benjamin was much the same, except for being a little greyer about the muzzle. The farm was more prosperous now and better organized. The windmill had been successfully completed and the farm possessed a threshing machine and a hay elevator. But the luxuries of which Snowball had taught the animals to dream, the stalls with electric light and hot and cold water and the three-day week, were no longer talked about. Somehow it seemed as though the farm had grown richer without making the animals themselves richer except, of course, for the pigs and the dogs. And yet the animals never gave up hope. If they went hungry, it was not from feeding tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. No creature called any other creature master. All animals were equal. 
One day in early summer, Squealer led the sheep out to the other end of the farm to teach them a new song. It was just after the sheep had returned on a pleasant evening and when the animals were making their way back to the farm buildings that the terrified neighing of a horse sounded from the yard. It was Clover. The animals rushed into the yard. Then they saw what Clover had seen. It was a pig walking on his hind legs. Yes, it was Squealer. A little awkwardly, as though not quite used to supporting his considerable bulk in that position, he was strolling across the yard. And a moment later, out from the farmhouse came a long file of pigs, all walking on their hind legs. And finally out came Napoleon himself, majestically upright, casting haughty glances from side to side, and with his dogs gambling round him. He carried a whip in his trotter. There was a deadly silence. Amazed, terrified, huddling together, the animals watched the long line of pigs march slowly round the yard. It was as though the world had turned upside down. Then came a moment when the first shock had worn off and they might have uttered some word of protest. But just at that moment, all the sheep burst out into a tremendous bleating of four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better. Benjamin felt a nose nuzzling at his shoulder. He looked round. It was Clover. Her old eyes looked dimmer than ever. Without saying anything, she led him to the end of the barn where the Seven Commandments were written. There was nothing now except a single commandment. It ran, All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. After that, it did not seem strange when next day the pigs all carried whips. It did not seem strange to learn that the pigs had bought themselves a wireless set, were arranging to install a telephone, had taken out subscriptions to John Bull and the Daily Mirror. A week later, a number of dog carts drove up to the farm. A deputation of neighboring farmers had been invited to make a tour of inspection. They were shown all over the farm and expressed great admiration for everything, especially the windmill. That evening, loud laughter came from the farmhouse, and suddenly, at the sound of mingled voices, the animals were stricken with curiosity. What could be happening in there, now that for the first time animals and humans were meeting on terms of equality? With one accord, they began to creep as quietly as possible into the farmhouse garden. They tiptoed up and peered in at the dining room window. There, round a long table, sat half a dozen farmers and half a dozen of the more eminent pigs, Napoleon himself at the head of the table. The pigs appeared completely at ease in their chairs. The company had been enjoying a game of cards, but had broken off for a moment, evidently in order to drink a toast. Mr. Pilkington had stood up, his mug in his hand. It was a source of great satisfaction, he said, to feel that a long period of misunderstanding had now come to an end. There had been a time when it was felt that the existence of a farm owned and operated by pigs was somehow abnormal. But all such doubts were now dispelled. He believed that he was right in saying that the lower animals on Animal Farm did more work and received less food than any animals in the county. Indeed, he and his fellow visitors had observed many features which they intended to introduce on their own farms immediately. He concluded that there need not be any clash of interests between pigs and human beings. Their struggles and difficulties were one. If you have your lower animals to contend with, he said, we have our lower classes. This bon mot set the table in a roar. Gentlemen, concluded Mr. Pilkington, I give you a toast to the prosperity of Animal Farm. There was an enthusiastic cheering and stamping of feet. Then Napoleon intimated that he too had a few words to say. 
Like all of Napoleon's speeches, it was short and to the point. He too was happy that the period of misunderstanding was at an end. Their sole wish was to live at peace and in normal business relations with their neighbors. This farm, which he had the honor to control, was a cooperative enterprise. The title deeds were owned by the pigs jointly. Then he added that the name Animal Farm had been abolished. Henceforth, the farm was to be known as the Manor Farm, which he believed was its correct and original name. Again, the mugs were emptied. But as the animals outside gazed at the scene, it seemed to them that some strange thing was happening. What was it that had altered in the faces of the pigs? What was it that seemed to be melting and changing? They looked through the window again. Now a violent quarrel was in progress. There were shoutings, bangings on the table, furious denials. The source of the trouble appeared to be that Napoleon and Mr. Pilkington had each played an ace of spades simultaneously. Twelve voices were shouting in anger, and they were all alike. No question now what had happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again. But already, it was impossible to say which was which.